So the um, idea behind this session to share some of our experience as well as uh, uh, to uh, uh, tell you how you can utilize patterns uh, when it comes to uh, enterprise architecture. And then uh, uh, there are a lot of theories but how you can apply them in uh, practical side. So uh, most of you, you know what's a pattern but it's basically a generic solution for a uh, common recurring problem so that's what we call it as a pattern. So if we take a real world example, this is a pattern, like how to cross the road. So basically, um, if we have a traffic signal, then we wait for the pedestrian sign comes up, and then we cross the road. If there's no uh, such um, signal, then we look at the right side, left side, right side, and then cross the road. And um, uh, then the, uh, the pedestrians know that thing, as well as uh, the drivers, they have some discipline created with that pattern. Associated with that, there are uh, like uh, zebra signs and then various other signals coming and then uh, uh, there will be like uh, speed limits. Uh, so a lot of things associated with that when we create a pattern. So that's a really good example on our real world. Right? So when it comes to uh, uh, computer science and then IT, like we use various patterns during uh, a project timeline, uh, starting from the uh, requirements side. So I will go in detail later. Uh, so this is one uh, pattern. Uh, I will explain uh, this stuff uh, during the session. The next thing is about uh, enterprise architecture. So what is enterprise architecture? So this is, uh, I think, introduced a couple of, I think, around four or five years back uh, because of the complexity of the uh, problems that we are, uh, I mean, the solution that we are providing for complex problems, as well as the organization changes. The main thing is uh, the uh, different business units uh, doing various stuff. So there should be some kind of governance and then uh, some kind of um, uh, common practice practices, that's where the enterprise architecture introduced uh, to the uh, system. So basically, uh, uh, have, uh, has any one of you used uh, this framework? Okay. So I really like uh, Sackman framework because uh, when it comes to enterprise architecture, it's kind of a very high level thing. It's really hard to understand what it is and what we should, uh, we should deliver. So Sackman framework actually provide what are the processes required as well as what are the artifacts that we need in different levels of projects and then uh, to build a successful uh, enterprise architecture. So if you are kind of new or if you are uh, practicing and if you want to improve, uh, this is a really good uh, framework to look at and then uh, get whatever relevant for you. I'm not, you. You don't need to take everything, but whatever relevant for you, uh, you can take it from uh, this framework. Uh, uh, highly recommended to read about this. In the enterprise architecture, even it uh, started as a common, I mean, a shared uh, organization layer, there are a lot of challenges uh, we, we are facing today. The first thing is the less visibility of the projects because um, the projects are built uh, within the business units and then some of the projects are not even going to IT that we call them as shadow IT projects. So it's really hard to identify and uh, look at what, what are the projects are available as well as who owns these projects. So uh, it's a big challenge. As a result, that's why we hear a lot of um, uh, enterprise architecture groups are building platforms. So yesterday I did a talk uh, in the strategy track on uh, the uh, uh, specifically about this, how you can build a platform. So uh, the, to meet the first two challenges, the availability and the ownership, when you build a platform, then you can identify who's building applications as well as you can enforce different type of um, patterns as well as uh, standards uh, when it comes to a platform. Then the next thing is change management because frequent changes are happening. Uh, so um, if the enterprise architecture decisions are slow, then it's going to be an issue because uh, you can't deliver what business uh, teams are looking at. Then the development life cycles. Uh, again, it's related to the second point as well because uh, we have quick release life cycles. So um, enterprise architect should, uh, architecture should take quick decisions to support uh, the quick release cycles as well. Then the uh, standards, because a lot of standards are coming up and uh, the, when you put a uh, EA practice then you have to consider those stuff like, uh, like technical standards like RES, SOAP, 
protocol buffers, those type of things. And then there are kind of business uh, level uh, standards, like uh, uh, business specific standards. Now, it, when it comes to uh, insurance, there's a standard called a code. And then when it comes to um, uh, the uh, healthcare, there's HL7, financial, fixed, fast, those type of uh, standards are coming. Uh, so we need to take a look at those standards as well when we are making the decisions. Then the integration and API is key because um, you need to connect with uh, internally as well as externally. Uh, so um, it's really hard to be success without integration. And uh, we need to consider uh, how seamless integration can be implemented. Uh, but the challenge will be heterogeneous systems. Some systems support standards. Some systems doesn't support. Some you can connect real time. Uh, some you can't do. You have to do batch um, uh, as well. So we need to consider uh, that. And that's an enterprise architecture challenge as well. Then the architecture patterns, uh, if we uh, take a look like uh, at uh, early, we had object-oriented type patterns. And then object orientation improved. And then we went to a component-based architecture, like the COM, D, COM, COM plus. Um, and uh, with that, there's open standard came COBA. And after that, uh, the distributed processing standards came. Uh, with that, uh, we identified a lo lot of uh, enterprise application integration patterns, or EAI patterns. Then after that, uh, in 98, 99, uh, I think uh, the service-oriented architecture came into the picture. And with the service-oriented architecture, we can see a lot of sub-patterns created because uh, only service-oriented architecture can't support most of the business problems that we are uh, 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 trying to uh, provide solutions. The first pattern is the event-driven architecture, or EDA. And then the second thing called the resource-oriented architecture and web-oriented architecture and microservices. That's the, uh, the key uh, or the most interesting uh, um, architecture pattern for most of the architects. So I will go in detail about each and every uh, pattern under uh, service-oriented architecture, because most of the earlier patterns are not relevant for us. And even we are struggling with those patterns. That's where the uh, SOA come into the picture uh, to provide solution for earlier patterns that we use to do uh, various uh, solutions. So in uh, theory or in textbooks, it says like the architecture uh, pattern to build highly loosely coupled distributed systems. So that's what SOA uh, in textbooks says. But uh, my definition is a little different. It's nothing new. So it's architecture style that you can use to fix broken architectures and apply different type of principles. So that's what I see uh, with SOA. So SOA started uh, uh, like this uh, with three components. Uh, a service uh, provider who provides the service, and a service uh, broker that advertises the service, and a service consumer. But uh, it did work at the early stage, but it was not enough again. And if you look at it today, it uh, got different type of uh, architecture layers. This is a standard uh, SOA uh, architecture, uh, architecture diagram. Uh, but uh, yesterday, I explained uh, something extended version. And if you look at it today, SOA represent only one layer <coughs> of a uh, complete enterprise architecture. If you can see uh, between the data virtualization layer and API layer, you see all the SOA components. Uh, so that's where uh, the um, SOA looks like in a today modern uh, enterprise architecture. So uh, this is a tweet that I did some time back, because most of the SOA projects that we are trying to um, deliver it uh, from the technical point of view, like how to write the service, what the contract looks like, and then uh, for performance, uh, so and so forth. So we need to consider all these stuff, but uh, mainly the services are based on the uh, consumer and their experience. Because what happens in most of the organizations, you write services, but nobody's using it because it doesn't uh, uh, provide the necessary functionality, or it's kind of really complicated to execute the service. So that's where like, you need to identify the consumer and their experience, and then improve um, uh, your services. That's where the API management um, uh, is a success, because APIs are more consumer driven. And uh, you have to quickly release different type of versions of the same API uh, because of the demand. So that's where the consumer and 
experience come into the picture. So I think uh, yesterday, the um, uh, one of the keynotes, it clearly explained how you can do this because uh, you can have the services, you can have the API, but without having an analytical platform, you can't do that. So analytics come into the picture to make this decision and uh, correct your APIs and services. So that's about SOA. Then the next pattern is uh, event-driven architecture. So I use this. Uh, I'm using this diagram because it's uh, basically a, a football game. So again, what happens? Uh, you can uh, treat the quarterback as the event um, provider, and then rest of the players as event subscribers because they will only get it theoretically, but somebody can take the ball as well. So it's kind of a, a real-world example of eventing that there will be uh, event providers as well as event subscribers in an event-driven architecture. So if you look at it, uh, it looks like this. Um, the key component is the event broker that uh, manage, produce, and uh, control all the events happening in the uh, uh, eventing architecture. And then uh, all the uh, event publishers and event subscribers might be not compliant with the protocols and the standards provided by the event broker. So that's where the event bus come into the picture that will do some kind of um, uh, protocol conversion, message mediation, and then make the uh, different type of messaging platform uh, compliant with the uh, functionality provided by the event broker. Then uh, you need security because uh, you can't just uh, 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 publish your events as well as you can't just let everybody to subscribe for the event. So there should be some kind of security. And then uh, the raw events might be need to process and there can be event processing um, engines uh, as well. Because uh, the disadvantage of uh, uh, eventing system, the network might get flooded with events, unnecessary events, and everybody might uh, start processing unnecessary events for that particular processor. So that's where like, you need to filter events. So the concepts like um, a complex event processor come into the picture, that you can uh, build a noise cancellation system and then only filter the relevant events and uh, reproduce them to the subscribers. That's where the event processing come into the picture. Then some kind of management, that's a governance piece, that how you manage these subscribers and uh, how you manage your sub, uh, publishers. And um, one beauty of this uh, pattern, uh, you can dynamically add uh, subscribers and you can dynamically add publishers but uh, in a, a, a commercial solution that you are building you can't let anybody to come and uh, do the uh, subscription that's where the event management come into the picture as well as uh, 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 at some time you uh, in in some cases you might have to remove a subscriber or you might have to remove a publisher so that's where the governance piece come and then uh, so you have the events event flows and then process and then give you a business results, but uh, you need to uh, analyze what's really happening. So you need an analytical platform there as well. So if we map this uh, reference architecture to um, WSO2 world, it looks like this. Uh, so event bus can be the enterprise service bus. And then we have a very um, uh, powerful and high performance uh, message broker that supports mul uh, multiple protocols like uh, JMS, AMQP, MQTT, um, and even uh, you can feed uh, things like uh, Kafka into uh, the message broker. And then the security piece uh, will be covered by the identity server and event processing uh, handled by the complex event processor uh, that uh, now we call it as part of the data analytical server as well. And then the event management, all the queues and topics, those things managed by the governance registry. And uh, the analytical piece will be handled by the uh, data analytical server. So that's kind of uh, a product mapping to the standard uh, uh, event driven architecture. Then the next piece is resource oriented architecture. So this uh, started with uh, this, uh, uh, this research paper done by Roy uh, Fielding and then uh, it, it became a standard <laughs> about uh, on top of HTTP how you can handle different type of resources and build a uh, resource oriented architecture. So the fundamentals of resource oriented architecture, it's a resource and a representation like a customer and an employee, uh, so and so forth. And there's a URI associated with that particular resource 
and uh, it will map to a HTTP method whether uh, based on the operation that you need to do, like a get or a put or a post, so and so forth. So on top of that, it's a very um, uh, kind of a, a easy way to access as well as e uh, easy way to document and very uh, self-explanation model that we have with the uh, resource-oriented architecture pattern. So the advantage of resource-oriented architecture and now uh, service-oriented is SOAP-based services and uh, these stress-based services. Basically, SOAP-based services are good for uh, enterprise level um, uh, application developers, but uh, for the um, creative and uh, uh, creative application developers who need to quickly build something, uh, it's kind of a, a time consuming thing, as well as a little bit complicated to do a simple thing. That's where the uh, REST principles are really uh, coming in handy for application development that you can uh, expose it as a REST. API and then application developers can quickly build applications by consuming these uh, services or we call them as APIs today. Then the next pattern is uh, web-oriented architecture. This is inherit from uh, the uh, resource-oriented architecture as well. Uh, basically provide a set of APIs for the uh, d different type of delivery channels to execute some kind of a business functionality. So it can be a web application or it can be a mobile application. Uh, rather than doing the traditional MVC type of uh, uh, approach, uh, uh, doing some client-side uh, processing and then having different type of beans associated with your application, um, call a service and then uh, do the execute something and the rendering will happen based on the API calls that you are doing. So that's about the web-oriented architecture. So there's a standard called web 2.2 and then again it's uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, heavily using the web-oriented architecture. So you can extend the web-oriented architecture to handle your client-side stuff using uh, advanced REST standards like ATOs and then uh, make it a proper uh, web-oriented architecture as well. Then this is uh, a diagram that I got. Uh, so it kind of explain uh, how these things link and then work together. But personally, if I uh, review this thing, I would put SOA at the top because for me, uh, SOA is not only about WS standards, it's rest and then rest of the other components as well. So that's how we can kind of categorize and then link these different standards into one single picture. Then the uh, next thing and the most uh, kind of interesting pattern that uh, everybody is excited today is called the microservices architecture. Actually, I am working on a slide deck uh, called the pragmatic approach to microservices architecture uh, and what's the role of the middleware in, in that particular architecture. So there's a uh, talk that I am doing at Gartner on December 1st, so still I'm working on it, uh, trying to identify. Uh, even Sanjeeva yesterday mentioned that uh, it's, uh, we have to take uh, the necessary stuff from that particular uh, architecture pattern and then implement uh, uh, what relevant and then what required for your uh, solutions. So basically, uh, this diagram explains uh, in a uh, high level like how uh, microservices architecture looks like. So you can see the pre SOA uh, or the SOA stage, like everything kind of uh, uh, very uh, chaotic mode. And then uh, SOA kind of uh, defined it into different pieces and then group it. And microservices, basically, that loosely coupled nature of the uh, application or the architecture uh, uh, change into a decoupled architecture. So if you look at it from a technical uh, diagram, like uh, you can see it like this how uh, the uh, loosely coupling and decoupling works. So the decoupling basically based on this concept called a pod, that you identify some related stuff and then make it a pod and then uh, build microservices based on the different type of pods. It depends on your uh, organization, it depends on your domain, and then it depends on what you are doing. So based on that, you have to identify what are your pods and then uh, define the different microservices in that. So this is uh, a definition, basically. Uh, it's uh, about um, how you build stuff on top of service-oriented architecture and then make it more um, agility and then flexibility of uh, 
deployment. Because the, the fundamentals are relevant to SOA, but when we started SOA, we didn't have luxury to do the agility and then uh, like flexi flexibility of the de uh, deployment because we didn't have containers, we didn't have Docker, we didn't have Puppet, uh, so those type of tools we didn't have that time. But now we have everything, so it's kind of a, a way how we can make service-oriented architecture relevant for today and then use the uh, advantage of the tools that we are using in our infrastructures. So uh, it's basically, um, as I said, it's uh, using SOA best practices and then uh, link with the modern application development tooling. So that's where the power of this uh, pattern come into the picture. So this is another thing that uh, a lot of uh, uh, architects think it's about the size. But it's not about the size, it's about the scope. Like a micro is basically the scope that you have to scope it properly and then use it because if you try to uh, concentrate on the size, that will again uh, create a different issue um, in these uh, solutions. So this, uh, again, like how these pods works, basically it uh, has to be a single purpose and then loosely coupled and independently uh, uh, architected, designed and developed and managed by a uh, independent team. So that's the uh, beauty of the uh, microservices architecture. So the mo the most of these stuff actually we try to do, but then again, it didn't work because of the tooling and then the underneath infrastructure we didn't have. But today we can easily do that using uh, technologies like uh, Docker and Kubernetes. So this is a reference architecture of uh, Microsoft. I took it from Gartner. Uh, so th the key thing is uh, there's an inner architecture. So most of the architects are only concentrating on the inner architecture, like how you write microservices and then how you can have a runtime for the microservices. But there's out architecture as well to enable the capabilities of the microservices. That's where the service routing, uh, a service gateway, uh, and there should be a proper message channel uh, to communicate uh, with each and every microservice. So uh, it, it's kind of not only the inner architecture that how you write microservices, it's about uh, how you can have a complete ecosystem that support the entire um, functionality of this uh, nice architecture pattern. So if we uh, map the products uh, uh, in a high level, like uh, you can find the new product that we release called Gateway, can be used at the top and uh, align with the API manager as the Gateway layer. And then the, um, uh, the, the service discovery part can handle by the governance registry. And to write microservices, uh, we have a new runtime, very powerful and very lightweight, um, high-performance per runtime uh, to write uh, RESTful services called microservices server. And then the messaging channel can be a message broker. Uh, some uh, architects position it's kind of anti-ESB or anti-service uh, uh, bus type of an architecture, but uh, if you look at the reality, you might need to use uh, ESB as well because uh, you are not entirely converting uh, a system to microservices. You might have the existing services. Uh, so how we can leverage those stuff as well as uh, most of the systems are supporting open standards that you can communicate, but you might have some system doesn't support open standards. So uh, having an ESB will help uh, to connect with the old world and the new world as well. Then the data analytics server supports the analytical part and security identity server will cover it. In addition to that, you had to use uh, some other technologies like Docker, Kubernetes, and uh, Puppet type of uh, uh, DevOps and TechOps uh, tools. Then the, uh, uh, so uh, then the, in the journey of uh, delivering or building an application, you will apply patterns at different stages. So the first stage is called the, uh, the requirement gathering stage. So there we apply different type of business patterns. So business patterns are uh, uh, relevant for that particular domain and the organization. So uh, as a practice, what we recommend for the customers to do, identify the new requirements and then uh, look at the current applications and the systems and identify the delta because uh, you don't need to build everything. Uh, you can reuse most of the stuff exists and you can identify, identify the delta as the uh, uh, and then convert it to an architecture. So uh, uh, some uh, examples for business architecture patterns because most of you are not uh, familiar with uh, this stuff, I think. So that's why I put some samples. So these are, it's totally depend on your domain as well as uh, your what 
you are trying to do as a business, you have to define these uh, type of different uh, business architecture patterns. And then there's a role called business architect. I think it's kind of a new role. Um, we had this uh, role called the business analyst. Uh, today in the modern, uh, I think, uh, organization uh, structures, uh, we treat that as a business architect, not only a business person, some kind of um, uh, technical knowledge they have as well, because the whatever the business architectures, uh, architecture documents built by these business Business architect can directly used by a technical architect and convert to a, a technical architecture. So that's the idea of a business architect. Then the um, how you do it basically. So you do the first business architecture and then use the business architecture patterns. Then you define the solutions architecture that you use solutions architecture patterns. In um, uh, so we call solution we basically divide the solution solutions architecture into two levels. Well, first one called level zero, second one called level one. Level zero uh, uh, solutions architecture we don't put any vendor product or uh, uh, product names. It's basically a component architecture diagram define each and every uh, component required to build that solution. And the level one architecture diagram will have all the relevant components or the products that you need to use or the tools that you need to use um, at the uh, solutions architecture level. Then the application architecture uh, basically identify the uh, what are the integration patterns, what are the data models, what are the APIs you need to uh, uh, you need for this particular solution, like that document and identify all these things at the uh, application architecture level. Then the runtime architecture, more about the deployment, how these things run in your production environment, uh, how, uh, how many environments you need, do a capacity planning, do a deployment architecture, and then identify the security. So at that level, you can use the deployment architecture patterns as well. So uh, you can use the standard patterns, but uh, you can create your own patterns as well, uh, again, based on what you are trying to do. So creating your own patterns will help, uh, because then you can reuse it as well as make them as enterprise architecture practices. So as an example, we uh, identified this pattern called a service firewall pattern with a specific customer. Uh, so the issue they had, they had a one-way firewall. In most cases, uh, you can, uh, once you trust the stuff, you can do two-way communication, but in this data center, it was one way. Uh, so we identify a pattern that we put a message um, a broker in the DMZ, or the outer layer, and then uh, whenever the incoming message comes, we put it to an in queue. So from the internal, uh, I mean, in the LAN, there's an internal gateway that subscribe for that particular queue and take the messages in. And whenever you want to send a response back, uh, you put it to out queue and uh, the external gateway will subscribe for that, take it and t send it to the uh, c consumer. So basically, this is not a high performance system. Uh, in a high performance nature, this might not work. But for the uh, throughput and the latency requirements, they had the uh, this perfectly work. Um, the advantages, we didn't um, want to change any infrastructure level policies they had. We used it as it is and it did work uh, perfectly. So uh, in summary, this is about the pattern. So the advantage is uh, it's used it before. So when you are taking it, you have some kind of an assurance. And since a lot of people using it, it's error proof. Uh, and then uh, it becomes the architect's language, because that is one experience that I had whenever we talk to architect. If we talk uh, based on the patterns, it's kind of a, a nice dialogue, because both parties can understand it, as well as it's a good way to document this stuff as well using different patterns. As example, enterprise integration patterns. When you use enterprise integration patterns and the notations, it's really easy to explain the, uh, your integration scenario to anyone. Then uh, the third thing is you will have a catalog of patterns so that you will feel really comfortable when you are uh, starting an uh, architecture, uh, designing an architecture, because you know that you can reuse some of the stuff in your catalog and apply it to your um, uh, solution. So that those are the advantages that uh, when you have a pattern-driven nature as well as uh, once you identify what are the correct patterns for your organization uh, or your enterprise architecture. Um, that's it.